Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another session with Dental Shadowers. Today, we have a very exciting session with Dr. Rafi. Dr. Rafi, thank you so much for joining. And on that note, the floor is yours to take away. Hmm, thank you. Thank you, Isa. So it's my pleasure um, to just be here and get to talk to you guys about my passion, which is cosmetic dentistry. If you haven't already followed my Instagram account, go ahead and do so. My Instagram account is drdr.tabasongrafi. My first name is Tabasong. Actually, my first name in my language, it means smile. So I always say to my family and friends and my patients and everyone that my parents chose the profession for me. I didn't choose it myself. <laughs> yeah, so just go ahead and follow. Here you go, hold on. Okay, wait, are the pictures covering the slides or no? No, I can see it perfectly. So you're seeing the entire page? Yeah, it's a uh, intro to cosmetic dentistry. Okay, because it's actually covering mine. Hold on, I'm just gonna minimize the zoom here. Okay. All right, so today we're gonna talk about cosmetic dentistry and ways to approach it. Before I get started here, I just wanna kind of clarify to you guys that cosmetic dentistry is actually a very subjective thing. And a lot of dentists claim to be cosmetic dentists, including myself, and it's a path to perfection. A lot of people have been practicing this field of dentistry in particular for years. And um, really how it works is you kind of have to choose your cases, you choose your continuing education courses, you choose your mentors, and the way you market for yourself and the way you present yourself defines you as a cosmetic dentist. There is no such thing as cosmetic dentistry as a specialty. I just want to clarify that and uh, really let you know, because before at UCLA, there used to be a specialty, uh, like kind of like a residency for one year that a lot of people would just go through and come out as cosmetic dentists and they just took that off and it's no longer even available. And that was the only cosmetic dentistry, like kind of subspecialty thing that was out there. Right now, there's no such thing. So the way to become a cosmetic dentist is really to market for yourself as one, pick your cases, um, the ones that are involved a lot of, there's a lot of cosmetic cases out there and you just pick those patient selection is everything. And, uh, also your continuing education and your mentors, your research, the, the way you do your research is everything, everything, especially undergrad, especially dental school, during dental school, the kind of publications that you have and all of that defines you as a cosmetic dentist. At the end of the day, it's a personal interest and it's not an official specialty. So today I'm hoping I familiarize you with that field and hopefully give you a chance to get a vibe, get a feel for how this whole thing works before you choose what kind of dentistry you want to practice. And then hopefully we can have, because it's a very intimate group of people, hopefully we can have a good Q&A and really get to hang out together. Okay. So my journey to becoming a dentist, uh, I got my bachelor's of science in biology from UCLA, uh, graduated in 2013. And then I got my DDS from UCSF in 2018. Uh, also in 2017 and 18 is when I actually got to know Dr. Pascal Manier. And that's when my really deep down interest of cosmetic dentistry really bloomed, I want to say. His uh, field of work is called biomimetic studies at USC, University of Southern California. And do yourself a favor, look him up. His name is Pascal Manier. His last name is M-A-G-N-E. And he's really that one cosmetic dentist that I look up to. Like everybody else is just trying to really be as good as he is he's really good very thorough he has his books has been translated into i think 14 or 15 languages all around the world he gives a lot of lectures and i actually got to participate in one of his studies too at usc uh graduated 2018 and ever since i've been doing uh, practicing in private practice in orange county california 
most of my time I've been in this office that I'm actually sitting in right now and you're going to see some pictures of it later. Today's the end of the day and everybody's already left me. Uh, I would have given you guys a tour of everything too. I mean, I still can. Uh, I started here late 2018, like I want to say three months after I graduated and I've been here actually all along. Um, the way our office works is um, I'm the sole dentist working here as a general and cosmetic dentist and then we have multi-specialties so we work with a periodontist that comes to the office we work with an endodontist that comes to the office we work we have an or amazing orthodontist um, that comes to the office and we also have um, the business is owned by a pedodontist so the orthopedo mostly work together the, on the other side of the building and then i'm here with the adults cases and specialty come about two to three times a month. Okay, uh, so what is cosmetic dentistry? We keep saying cosmetic dentistry, it sounds so sophisticated and everything. So it's basically uh, general dentistry, but then you just pick a lot of cases that involve um, maybe full mouth rehabilitation. So I wanna say correction of smile, it can be just one tooth, a cosmetic procedure, or it can be all of the teeth in the person's mouth. So it really doesn't necessarily have to be like all 28 of your teeth to be called a cosmetic case. It can be as mild as it gets, or it can involve several, several teeth, uh, or even the entire mouth from one to 32. Uh, advancement of smile in any shape or form, shade, function, and it most of the times includes, um, but it's not limited to alignment. So a lot of our cases, for example, you want to do a smile reconstruction, you kind of work hand in hand with an orthodontist at the same time. A lot of the cases that I already pick has have already completed in this line, have completed clear aligners, and then they come to us for that final touch up. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I just want to kind of reiterate on the point that cosmetic dentistry is not just about the teeth that you see and the frame of the smile. It's about all of your teeth. It's about the health of all of your teeth and the entire smile line. So a typical day of my life, I get up early and I pick this habit up very recently and I'm loving it. I usually work out before coming into the office. Uh, my days at the office start sometimes 7 a.m., sometimes 8, sometimes 9. So if it's an 8 or 9 a.m. day, I usually work out before coming in. If it's a 7 a.m., it's too early, so I just leave it for after. I bike a lot, and I sometimes hit the gym. Coffee is a big part of my life, so usually I start the day with gym and coffee. When I get to the office... We have a little bit of a, um, like a tiny little huddle between me and my assistants mostly. I have two main assistants and we do kind of like a case review. So they've been around in this office a lot longer than I have. So let's say I've been here around like about three years. They've been here almost 30 years. So they know everybody and their history and whatever happened to them 10 years ago and what incidents, like what medical history incidents, everything, even patient management. It's really helpful to have really good assistants and they're just your right hand. They can, it's a deal breaker if they're not good, but if they're good, you're, it's like, it feels like you're working with another dentist. So I'm lucky enough to work with amazing, amazing assistants. And usually between me and the two of them, we do a quick, very quick, like five minute case review. We just look and evaluate the cases. We make sure we're not missing anything. We know what we're doing and uh, the cases have arrived. Um, there is no modification or correction needed. We just look at, for example, if it's a bigger case, if it's like six, seven, eight units delivery, we just go ahead and, um, look at them on the models and the study models make sure that they look good at least before we deliver them and then 
that kind of stuff. So my days are nine hour days. We have four hours and then one hour break in between and then four hours in the evening or afternoon. And the way my columns work is that I have one procedure columns. I was looking at the other dentists that kind of gave talks before and they have all these crazy schedules. There's like three columns with ER, with three hygienists and five walk-ins. This is not it. This is not the office for that. So I'm really lucky that I'm, this is this is the style of dentistry that I'm practicing. And for you to be able to really focus on, especially bigger cases, you kind of have to um, limit yourself and kind of give yourself enough time to do everything correctly. So we have uh, one column one column and for my procedures I at least give them one hour to one and a half hours sometimes two to three hours depending on the case and uh so I'll, everybody's texting me saying that they're behind the zoom meeting and they can't get in I don't know if it's like frozen or something oh do you mean um mystery oh I see I see I'm, I'm gonna admit them right now okay There we go. It should be working. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Welcome everyone. A lot of people behind the door. We're sorry about that. We were kind of like just talking for 10, 15 minutes without realizing that everybody's waiting. We didn't miss much. It was just the intro. We were just kind of like chit-chatting and gave a quick little intro on cosmetic dentistry and how it works and what this specialty is all about and we're just talking about my normal day right now so I mean if you have questions about that we can always go back and talk about that later so yeah like one column only of procedures um, usually average procedure is like I, I do about five main procedures a day if it's crown and bridge if it's restorative and then we have hygienists, one column or two column. And then we always leave a little bit of room, especially Mondays. For some reason, people party a lot and there's a lot of walk-in. So people come in with broken teeth, broken front teeth that they open with beer bottles and stuff like that. So you see a lot of that, especially on Mondays. Like today I had three walk-ins already. So that's my typical day. And this is our office our beautiful office so the furthest left I mean I'm here right now you can kind of get a view of how it looks there's four operatories and you all get like a little bit of a view of a Japanese kind of style garden there used to be koi fish here before the uh, the cats got them uh, and that's on the on the farthest right side you see the hallways and I love flower decorating and just like dealing with flowers so I try to bring in like a bouquet here and there and that little arrangement right there is probably mine <laughs> I worked on that <laughs> so that's the office vibe so when I'm talking about my cases you can kind of like see where it's done and kind of get a vibe of where it's all happened so what kinds of procedures does cosmetic dentists do um Cosmetic dentistry, like we already talked about it, it's it basically everything that a general dentist does, does it. But mostly if it involves reconstruction of the smile line, that's the, that's the field for a cosmetic dentist. There is no such thing as amalgam fillings in the world of cosmetic dentistry. You would be surprised that a lot of dentists are still doing silver fillings, uh, not around here. So resin restoration, and the world of resin restorations, we've came such a long way. There's so much you can do with resins. Uh, you can pretty much reconstruct a whole smile line without even people being able to tell that this is just white fillings. So resin restorations are just white fillings. Uh, crowns and bridges, restorations of implants. I know a lot of dentists place their own implants. I still have a, haven't learned that whole feel so I only restore but even that is pretty fun and goes a long way and also I think somebody's drawing on my slides and uh, veneers <laughs> veneers they're so in these days um full mouth reconstructions involve anywhere from 
I want to say like if it's more than just the front teeth, just a couple teeth, if it's dealing with the entire bite, if you're dealing with this entire health of the mouth, that's full mouth reconstruction. Bite and function rehabilitation is another favorite of mine. It's very complicated. I'm still about to learn that. So a lot of times when you're doing a full mouth reconstruction, it's not only you're dealing with every single tooth in the mouth, but also you're changing the dimension of occlusion, basically, if the bite isn't open enough and patient's already finished or so and they've already completed all the recommended treatments, it's still not enough space for clearance for giving it that perfect bite, you actually have to go ahead and open the patient's bite with crowns and bridges or implant crowns or whatever your treatment plan is and it, it includes. So that's a very, I want to say the more most complex part of uh, a full mouth reconstruction case is that part. And new technology and cosmetic dentistry. So we have the digital smile design. Digital smile design or DSD is a software that a lot of cosmetic dentists use. And what you do is you take a lot of pictures, a lot of pre-op pictures, you upload it on the software. And on the software, you can actually pick from the pre kind of established logos and shapes of the teeth that's the, uh, the software gives you the options to choose from. You can choose from that, put it on the patient's smile, and you can actually use it to set the expectations right. You know, when they know how it's going to look like, they can tell you right then and there that this is this, I don't like this, or it's too big, or it's too square, or it's too rounded, you know, things like that. But if they know how it looks, there's no, the element of surprise is kind of eliminated, or it at least it gets minimized with the DSD. Uh, digital 3D scanners or Itero, we use that in ortho a lot. So they scan the entire bite, the pre-op, uh, the entire relationship of the jaw everything and it's also used for um, the relationship of where the jaw is and where the bite is during and after each full mouth rehabilitation so let's say I'm dealing with a lot of posterior or back teeth and I want to know where the patient is occluding or biting on them so instead of just guessing or using the traditional ways of using articulating paper or carbon papers to leave marks and that way the, the record isn't even um, like somewhere to look back at. You use the iTERA technique. So it's, you were scan the entire top jaw, you scan the entire bottom jaw, the relationship of the two and how the patient bites down. So when you get the new round of crowns for the entire arch all at the same time, or even if when you split it down, you look back at those records and you try to recreate where the bite is. That's only if the bite is not being regenerated or reconstructed and you're happy with where the bite is. Too many details. So uh, CVCT is just a, a CT scan of the teeth. And usually you use that when you're, when you're working with perio or endo. So those specialties hand in hand with cosmetic. So you take that, they interpret it, they do the whatever treatment they need to do, and then they pass on the patient back to us. Digital charting is not much of a new technology, but it goes a long way. Again, uh, hopefully when you're done with your school and you're looking for a job, you're gonna be surprised with how a lot of offices are still using just the paper charting. And a lot of dentists actually prefer to just write down um, all the documentation and everything, not so much me. I prefer digital charting, you can always go back to your ledger all the way back to the 80s 90s and see when this crown was done and uh, what material was used and which provider actually did it whereas with paper charting it's really hard to go back all the way intraoral cameras they're my all-time favorite and the new technology came such a long way with those the quality of the pictures that you can take with the intraoral camera is ridiculous like it works better than any macro lens sometimes if you invest in a really good intraoral camera uh, or the office that you work in has one and patriots speak a million words so you just take a picture for your patients you tell them, hey, this is what's wrong with this tooth and you, need to, you gotta fix it, or this is your smile line from the inside, or these are your bottom teeth that you thought you were cleaning so good and <laughs> this is the amount of calculus or whatever is sitting there. Uh, so it's really good, especially for communication. It's one of my favorite technologies. 
dental photography tools and just the extra oral cameras. I don't know if you guys have ever been exposed or if you're into photography or not. There's a whole world of continuing education courses on just extra oral photography and how much you can do. And these macro lenses, the dual flashes, the entire, the whole thing, the whole field, especially I feel like with um, digital marketing and social media, that field is just growing and expanding by day. And if you don't know how to do it, you're going to be behind. And I'm still working on that. So you're going to see my cases pictures. And some of them are really good. And some of them are very like pixely and blurry. And you're going to see my progress along the way too. So like I said before, it's just um, you live and you learn. <laughs> So that's that. Any questions so far? Is everybody awake? Yeah, we have a couple questions. You want to leave it for the end or um, just read it out now? It's up yeah. to you. If you want to write them down or if people can type it in the chat section. Yeah, they actually just, they typed it in the chat, but I can read it out or we can just leave it for the end. Whatever is more comfortable for you. Sure. How about we address a couple of them now? Okay, cool. So did you ever want to specialize in something else? I actually did think about oral surgery. That was the only thing I was interested in other than cosmetic dentistry. And I know it's like the ends of spectrums, like the opposite ends with oral surgery. You're not much of a risk. Like, I don't know, you're not dealing with restoring teeth. You're more dealing with removing them and extracting them. Whereas with cosmetic dentistry, you are dealing with restore as many as you can hold on to them for as long as you can nothing beats your own tooth kind of a thing so but oral surgery what held me back was actually to be quite frank with you guys was the number of years of residency that was the only thing which yeah. is a, is it three or four years it depends on the type of program you get into it can be minimum of four and maximum of six years oh so wow if you get into a program and you don't get much of a choice with residency you like it's like you match and you kind of have to proceed with it but uh with the six-year program you actually have to do two years of medical school all over again and it's pure didactics and then four years of training in hospitals the long on-call shifts i have so much respect for our oral surgeons and the number of years of their lives that they dedicated to the field it's really really impressive yeah especially if they have to go to medical school on top of all of that yeah it's a lot of work it is. um let's see we can do one more question and then we can just continue if you want yeah, sure um let's see do you say your day at the office always is always busy or one case takes hours so maybe you don't see so many patients i actually my days are not too busy but they're perfect so this is the thing about dentistry and it's, i wish i kind of knew that when i was it was like i don't know like issues or something because the type of practice that you work at makes the world of a difference so there is the PPO fee for service cash concept. And then there's the whole HMO, Medi-Cal, see as many patients volume kind of an office. And my goal was to really see as little patients as possible, like as few as possible, but really spend a lot of time on each case and really take my time with just focusing on what I enjoy doing rather than seeing so many patients that I can't even like bend my neck at the end of the night kind of a practice so I actually had to try because when you get out of school you don't have a lot of choices I had to give it a chance uh, I worked at those high volume offices for about two three months and then lucky enough I got this position and I've been here for almost three years now and I'm loving it so no not my days my days aren't too crazy they're very predictable our patients have been coming here for decades and they know that the, the recommended treatment is what they need and the, the trust is there so there isn't much of a selling going on there isn't a lot of negotiation or arguments or a lot of complaints it's very easy very laid back very friendly super family-like kind of a vibe that's awesome so you like to take it slow but actually like put you know effort and try to build a relationship with them yeah that's what i prefer All right, shall we continue? Yeah, you can uh, go ahead and move on if you want. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh huh. So here are so in the instructions that I gave uh, that I received from you guys, I uh, saw that you wanted for me to focus on cases. So that's what I actually did. So uh, I hope that it doesn't get too tiring. If whatever, it's too much information, you guys stop me at any time. So this is our first case, our beloved 59-year-old female presented to our office for a comprehensive oral evaluation and full mouth series and hygiene. And we reviewed medical history. Medical history was non-contributory. The chief complaint was the opacity or the lack of character, the shape, the shade, the wear and the spacing of the bottom teeth. Uh, we evaluated extraoral and intraoral cancer screenings, all within normal limits. The temperamental mandibular joint is healthy, no clicking, no history of lockjaw. Perio is evaluated, stable-ish, uh, oral, oral hygiene is good. So we treatment plan for phase, the different phases for the perio phase, for the restorative phase. And at the end, we uh, treatment plan for recall and maintenance. And this is the before and this is the after picture. So in this case, uh, we did about, actually, let me refer back to my, cause I don't have access to my slide notes to be accurate. Um, this case, we did 13 veneers total, seven crowns, uh, three resin restorations. So the total number of teeth that were treated in this case were 23. The bite was not adjusted or articulated. I'm sorry, it wasn't articulated all over again. The bite is where it was. Uh, so no dimension of occlusion was not changed. And the patient already had some pre-existing implants and the restorations on those were healthy. So we didn't mess around with those, but everything else was uh, kind of fixed and adjusted and corrected. And in this next slide, you're gonna see the details of pretty much behind the scene of really what happened. By the time the patient, like from the moment that the patient walks through the door until they're done and completely happy and actually smiling from heart and walk out the door, there's so much communication involved. And I always say, if you're a dentist, you have to be just so patient. Patience is a virtue and especially for dentists that you have to be able, like you kind of have to be willing to repeat yourself over and over again. You have to clarify, you have to draw a map of everything for them. You have to really explain to them what every step of the game is gonna look like. So with this case, what we did was uh, we took impressions of the top and the bottom jaw. We took bite registrations when the patients bite down on the impression materials. And we also took jaw records. Um, we sent them to the lab and I actually got the wax up. So the wax ups that I got, I asked them either send them in or email pictures to me. In this case, they actually, in this case, they actually emailed me pictures of the top and the bottom wax ups. So wax up is basically how the final product is gonna look like but instead of porcelain, it's gonna be in wax. And if you don't like what you see, you go back and forth and you modify it and you change it and you tell them this is how you want it to look like. For example, the wax ups that I got at, the, at first, they were too short, they were too bulky. They didn't include a lot of character. It was dull, it was missing personality. Uh, it wasn't like very feminine. So with time with communication with lab so you really are a middle person in between your patient and what they expect to get out of the case and with the lab and how limited they are as far as delivering patients expectations so you're you're a middle person and you have to be patient with that so we would i would receive the wax ops and we would communicate with them back and forth and then we finally finalized the wax ops and we had access to this um what you see on the cast is the porcelain, but before it was glazed. In this case, we uh, chose Emacs layered material. I don't know if that makes a difference for you or if it makes sense at all to you guys at this point, but just so you know, it's like really the most translucent, the most viral looking material out there and how it reflects light is exactly how, or as close as it gets to your own enamel. So it's really amazing how far we've came. Whereas if you look at the full mouth rehabilitation cases from the nineties, these are porcelain fused to metal uh, cases that 
that lack, this opacity, this translucency, this vitality, and uh, the anatomy and the grooves and everything that you can give the tooth to give it character. So um, it's very impressive how far we came. So they sent me the porcelain pictures before glazing it for one last check. And then once we okayed it and we we're like, it's perfect, it's ready to go. I showed it even to my patients. I'm like, this is how it's gonna look like. Do you have any comments? Do you wanna change anything about this? Um, they approved it, we approved it. And, um, and it was preceded, uh, we, we finished it. It was glazed and we delivered it. A lot of times though, what happens is you get the crowns and you put them in patient's mouth. The patient is not sure if they love it if they want to live with it for a good while for probably the next hopefully 25 to 40 years of their lives so they're just not sure it's a commitment it's a big commitment so what you do is you get them in, you get the final product but you temporarily deliver them instead of using your final cementation technique you can actually use your temporary cement you put it in and um and they just go home and they basically go for a test drive and if they love it they come back in two weeks three weeks you're like they either want modifications or you're like okay let's just go ahead and proceed any new questions so far let me check. Nope. test drive parts my clients test drive too <laughs> <laughs> um what is an example of the most rewarding type of case that you've done in contrast to this question, what would be, what would a difficult case look like for you? I think as far as that, such a good question is this, as far as dentistry goes, there's no such thing as difficult because when you work with specialists, you're not the last resort. And you know, you always have someone else that knows a lot more than you and is, the, is more specialized in the field. And that's what I love about where I'm sitting. So there's no stress, nobody's sweating around here and everybody's only doing what they're comfortable doing. Nobody's going out of their, I don't know, lot, bending, bending over backwards to do the thing that they don't even know what they're doing and how they're doing it. So there's no such thing for me as far as uh, stressful dentistry, but when it comes to patient management, sometimes, uh, anxious patients, I want to say they're a little bit more difficult to kind of manage and you really have to uh, finalize your treatment plan, not only based on your patient's needs and expectations, but also based on your patient's medical history and also your patient's kind of emotional stability. And that's true because a lot of patients out there, they might be distressed, they might be anxious, they might be just, uh, they have major phobia from the dental office. And um, you kind of have to go around and look at that and really see if they're a good case for where you're standing as far as your practice. So case selection, I think, I wanna say I never had a negative experience because I selected my cases really wisely and I have a team that supports my decisions rather than pushing me into doing things. And if it's good for me and if it's in the best interest of our patients, we go ahead and do it. If not, you really, it's better sometimes not to touch something that you don't know what you're doing and the patient isn't ready for it yet. Of course, of course. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let me see. We can do one more question. Um, what are the advantages and disadvantages of resin versus amalgam fillings? Uh, that's a good question. There's so many studies on that outside. Uh, basically, long story short, resin or composite fillings are basically white fillings. So obviously, they're more cosmetic you think that you put them in the back tooth somewhere, but still patients have had it for 15 years, they come in, they still don't like it because they laugh, they smile, and it shows and they're just unhappy with the looks of it. So look is the biggest downside of the amalgam fillings, but amalgam fillings, every study out there, is, it's proven, it's in every literature out there, it has lower rates of recurring caries or reinfection. So you have a silver filling, it can stay there. If you have good oral hygiene, if you see the dentist um, routinely, if you're on top of everything, you have less chance of recurring infection, recurring decay underneath those fillings, rather than you do the best composite fillings, you're the best patient, the material shrinks. 
And that's why there's a lot more of uh, recurrent caries, recurrent infections, recurrent decay underneath those white fillings. So pros and cons for both. That was an awesome explanation. Thank you so much. Of course. All righty. So let's move on. Case number two. This is a cool case. My beautiful 34-year-old female presents for just an exam, full mouth x-rays. She really didn't love her front teeth, that's all. But we were just taking x-rays to see how things are looking. And then we found a couple of crowns that were ill-fitting and there was recurring caries underneath them. On top of that, she was just a little unhappy with the looks of things. This is a very subtle case. I put my heart in it and I just love the outcome of it. And we treatment planned. A lot of planning beforehand, a lot of uh, restorative care, and a lot of maintenance after, and we'll see why. So this is actually a full mouth case, but I'm only showing you guys the front six teeth because I still haven't had a chance to uh, capture my post-op x-rays. We're letting the, the tissue healing complete, and then we're going to take our post-op, uh, not x-rays, I'm sorry, pictures. So this is the before, and what you see on the right side is the final after of the six front crowns those are all crowns because patient from before patient had crowns so i had to replace them with crowns i didn't have the option of choosing veneers in this case and this is called emax layered katana and it's pressed so don't even worry about that what it means is that it's just so translucent that you can see from from the front you can literally see the backside of it so a lot of translucency, a lot of improvement as far as the shape of the teeth. So what the patient didn't like was that they would smile and it would kind of look like um, not, not so appropriate for their age, but right now the bunny looking cute front teeth with the sharp canines and the perfect difference of length between the centrals and the laterals and everything about that, those marginal ridges, those bulky distal marginal ridges, everything about this case, what an upgrade it was. So how we did it was a lot of going back and forth between, like I said, the lab, and the patient's expectations. So what I do is when the patients walk in, I always have this kind of like a little huddle session with them before we even start drilling, before even presenting the finances or any of that. We just sit down and talk for one and a half hours and that's how it's done. And it's just called consultation. And what you do is you ask them specifically what's bothering them and what they wanna get out of it. And then a lot of times what we do is we send the patients to lab for live shading. And this is a fantastic lab in Irvine that I recently started working with. And I, if the patient has to go in for live shading and if it's a big case, I go with them. So this lab in particular, what they do is that they sit down with the doctor and the patient and they have a big brochure of different shapes that the teeth can have, different smile arches, the arc, the, uh, the angle of the teeth and how wide the front teeth can get, how long they want it, everything. So you sit down with them and you really, every single tooth, you select the shape and the form and the anatomy of the teeth and everything that you want it or you want for it to look like. And then after they select the shape and the lab itself, collects all the data that they need. So I do my own photography and the lab, this is, these are the technicians that worked on this case. They do their own photography and um, they just go from there. And in a case like this, my patient wanted zero and one shade, which is a bleaching shade. So we actually uh, left only the four front teeth on the bottom intact without drilling. So we had to do intensive bleaching before getting the veneers in to make sure the the shade matches the top the bleaching shade with the bottom actual teeth so that's the case um really cool case really amazing outcomes a lot of a lot of communications and definitely worth all the efforts this case is amazing so when you ask me what's the most rewarding case you've ever done I kind of just want to, like my heart answers this, this case number three is my all time favorite case. 
no questions asked. A uh, 66-year-old male uh, presents with comprehensive oral evaluation, x-rays, hygiene, uh, non-contributory medical history, social habits. This guy is unfortunately a, a heavy smoker and smokes one pack per day. Despite my several attempts, I've tried everything. I literally bought him nicotine patches and I... <laughs> On the day of delivery of the crowns, I was like, please stop smoking. So I'm hoping one day my prayers are going to be answered. And one day there's going to be that awakening moment for him. And he's just going to finally quit. He's tried multiple times. It's just very hard for him. His chief complaint, I think, is very cute. He wasn't able to date anyone because of the crowding of his teeth. And he told me he's been single for eight years. And every time, <laughs> it's just the teeth. It's the smile that like gets in the way uh also he had major pain on his laterals laterals are not the central teeth not the two front but the ones on the side so he had major sharp shooting pain there uh, we evaluated uh, a lot we evaluated past dental history uh cancer screenings the health of the joints, the amount of wear that he had everywhere, the abfractions, which are the loss of enamel in the form of a triangle on the outside surfaces of the teeth. These usually happen because of just like the way we're biting down, normal wear and tear and all of that, recession of the gums. So all of those were evaluated. We listened to his cosmetic concerns. Then again, crowding was one of the major, major concerns in this case for both me and the patient. Um, and we had to include perio in this case and i'll tell you guys why we evaluated his oral hygiene a lot of the rostomia which is dry mouth because of intense smoking so uh, he had dry mouth and he it was actually to the point that was bothering him so first and foremost we started with addressing whatever pain he had so the pain, uh, like some of the molars in the back were infected, they had to be removed. So we removed all that emergency painful areas, like we pretty much got him out of pain. And then after that, we got to phase one, which is always perio and hygiene. So we did deeper cleanings uh, everywhere on all of his teeth and also completed a consultation with the periodontist. So when the periodontist took that CT scan that I was just talking about it earlier, they told me that there is no way that they can do anything about those crowded areas and they're not actually, um, they don't recommend implant in a case like this because of lack of bone, because of severe smoking and because of lack of compliance as far as quitting. So um, uh, perio just uh, declined patient of getting implants. So I didn't have that option, unfortunately here. Uh, that be because of that, I was very limited in a case like this. And this is how far we came. Uh, what we did was we, the side teeth that you guys see in the picture with the black ring around them, both of those teeth, and we diagnosed it by endo and by perio, both of those teeth were actually fractured off. They could not be saved. So I removed both of the maxillary which is a top set of teeth lateral incisors which are the two side teeth on top we remove them and we restored it with two three unit bridges and then on the bottom we just had to be creative so the front tooth that severely crowded and it's kind of sticking out we actually remove that tooth and if you look you can't really tell at all in this picture but patient is missing a tooth in the final uh, final picture, but then because the spacing is just kind of over, um, the, the space is closed using the crowns, you can't really tell at all that instead of four front teeth, this patient has three front teeth. Um, also, we did a lot of crowns in the back. We, um, we did four extractions total, and let me just look at that exact data. Here, as far as my numbers, um, yeah, uh, four extractions, one root canal, we did five fillings, we did 10 crowns, and we did two three unit bridges. So this case involved 24 teeth total. 
and the final is as good as it gets, very limited as far as the type of material. If you look and compare this final with the previous case or the one before that, it doesn't look as translucent because this material is not that layered, super translucent material. This is actually all zirconia crowns. And we had to use zirconia because I didn't have the option of correcting the bite. Patient uh, wasn't a candidate for ortho because of, again, bone losses and smoking. So we had to use a more durable material, which is a little bit less translucent, still very rewarding. And he cried and I was kind of like, literally sobbing at, on our last appointment, <laughs> very emotional day. <laughs> Very, very rewarding. Probably one of the highlights of my career so far. I have a question. So the I'm I'm assuming the difference between Emacs and Zirconia. Zirconia is just stronger and Emacs is more for like translucency. Yes. So Emacs is a porcelain crown, whereas Zirconia is a, a metal alloy. So basically okay. Zirconia is just basically a metal crown without looking like a metal. That's that makes sense. You can't really yeah, it doesn't transfer light as much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so these are just a bunch of like little cases. Um, I just included these to let you guys know that you can sometimes less is more. You don't always have to go above and beyond and include 24 teeth, 25 teeth, 23 teeth. You can do very minimal dentistry and still so rewarding and it's still considered cosmetic. The top i'm going to start with top left going down right the top left is a uh, patient lost the front tooth and this is actually just a front flipper so this is just a removable basically partial it comes in and out and it just matches the other two so perfectly and it's so rewarding and it's so easy the middle case um that's that's a really good case it involves about like uh, 10 crowns and also we did a lot of implants in this case we worked hand in hand with perio if you look in the back the right side the patient wasn't even didn't even have any back teeth to chew with and uh, we actually did five implants on him to kind of restore the function and give him enough teeth in the back to be able to basically occlude with and chew uh, lower right all the way down, four front crowns were replaced. These are the old crowns that I'm telling you guys. This is this material is porcelain fused to metal on top. The older is um, the older crowns were porcelain fused to metal. You see how kind of like discolored and very opaque looking. Those are even, I think, um, less cosmetics than zirconia because there is legit a silver metal covering the porcelain on the inside and then I changed this crown uh, these this set of crowns with again these are um, Emacs crowns so they're more a lot more translucent a lot more natural couple more cases uh, top left going to bottom right that one's again another partial case uh, restoring the buccal corridor and the smile from the side view from the right side. The center case, so dear to my heart. That's such an easy but so rewarding case. We had one single peg lateral that we replaced with one veneer only. And when you look at the final product, you can't really tell at all because the shade and the material and the, just the translucency of it matches with the rest of the smile so well that you can't really find it. Another one of the partials on the, on the bottom. Okay, so there was a section on the guided, uh, uh, the presentations that you guys sent me, it said advice to our future dentists. I have a couple of advices. Um, I think dentistry is just a career that you have to truly, truly love. And it's so important what type of specialty you choose. From where you are right now in pre-dental, it's kind of like, I just want to get into dental school. I don't care what happens next. I want you to change that mentality and really think of yourself as already a dentist and start exploring the fields of dentistry because it makes the world of a difference as far as your day, the flow of your day, your ergonomics, your posture, what your body can tolerate and what your days are gonna look like, the kind of audience that you're gonna have, the kind of demographics of the patients that you're gonna be dealing with. So it's so important, find your passion. 
whatever it might be like don't listen to anybody just listen to yourself do your own thing whatever you think is right if your parents want you to do whatever or if your friends are all doing one thing and you just want to follow that don't do that healthcare is about serving the community my two favorite words serving and community and i think and i keep saying that to everybody who's thinking about pursuing this career you are not just a dentist despite what everybody might, might tell you you are a community builder you have the power of creating a little society around you that loves you and you love them back and these people are going to become your family and uh, you just stay in one place more than two three years and it might not even be your own office and you're going to see how your daily interactions are going to change as a dentist and i believe as every individual whatever whatever setup you might might be you are responsible for the community around you and especially as a healthcare provider so my patients I'm just so lucky with them those cute couple in the middle those are my all-time favorite couples they stop by they dress up on Halloween they just stop by and say hi Christmas they bring me donuts they remind they remember my birthdays they remember everybody's birthday they're just so adorable and we have so many of those and I think it's a blessing for sure to be able to just create those interactions around you. A couple more advices. Your health comes first. If the plane is going down, you have to put the oxygen mask on your face first before everybody else. I have a little yoga mat right next to my desk, as you can see. <laughs> Uh, if you're thinking about becoming a dentist, doesn't matter how big or bulky or tall you are, you have to be athletic and fit and you have to take care of your own self, your health, your, your mental health and your physical health first because it can get challenging both mentally and physically. And my last advice is try to give back as much as you can. Uh, educate people because you're just not a dentist your teachers your educators no matter what age your patient might be you're teaching them something you're leaving a footprint in their hearts and in their in their day uh, for for a good while you kind of have to be very patient I never thought I was a patient person and then I feel like you kind of like gain that virtue as the time goes by and as you practice in the field long enough you you totally I mean, that you can't really do much about it. You, you just, you have to be it. <laughs> and then spread as much love as you can. And that's my little nerdy joke at the end. That's when the doc wants a mirror, wants the anesthetic syringe, wants the composite gone, or wants smoke a frappuccino. <laughs> that sums up my presentation. Hope you guys enjoyed. I love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Rafi. Um, <laughs> Ethan's actually going to be reading out some questions for us. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. So a few questions that we have that our YouTube uh, viewers have submitted in the chat. The first one is, in the next five years, what changes do you think we will see in dentistry? A lot has already changed with dentistry. Um, actually, you might already be able to see. I don't know if you can see that machine in the back. Like that we didn't have it a year ago a lot has changed just because of COVID and I want to say it's um COVID it it kind of like messed things up for a while but at the same time it helped a lot of professions but then a lot of people went out of business altogether so a lot changed because of that but as far as the future of dentistry technology is a big thing with dentistry especially if you're practicing cosmetic dentistry or any field really so you have to be you have to keep yourself operated I have a feeling especially with the uh, involvement of technology and also um, social media and how that's affecting the business aspect of dentistry the expectations of people are going to go a lot higher and people are going to see a lot of amazing amazing pre-ops and post-ops of these cases and they're going to want to come in and receive that quality work so i think what's going to change with dentistry is quality of care and uh, expectations awesome so our next question that we have is i think someone said what ages are appropriate to perform cosmetic dentistry on and then they said like the minimum and max ages yeah that's a really good question you don't obviously you don't perform cosmetic dentistry on um baby teeth 
or primary teeth. You perform cosmetic dentistry on permanent dentition. Uh, sometimes uh, you, on very, very exceptional occasions, you may or may not crown a temporary, uh, primary tooth that's been in the patient's mouth for years and years and it's got the circumferential decay. I've done that maybe two to three times. The tooth is so stable and it's not moving. So that's pretty much the extent of what you do on primary teeth, really on um, adults, but you can start anywhere from teenagers as little as bleaching, 14, 15 year olds and higher. The case of peg lateral that I showed you guys, my patient was 16. So that was a single veneer. A lot of peg lateral cases, a lot of patients that finish ortho and are just unhappy with the four front teeth, six front teeth, those are patients that are sometimes 13. I've, I've done I've done veneers on 13 year olds. So it gets as, long, as young as that and as old as you want. I've done four front crowns on my patient that was 101 year old. And after the appointment was going to see her older sister who was 103 years old. So she left the office and she went to see her older sister. So really it's the life expectancy and the quality of life that they want to live their patients. Very cool. That's awesome. All right. So the next question is, do you, how do you recommend cosmetic dentistry to patients without relaying it as rude or being overbearing? Oh, that's such a good question. Usually if I see it, they've seen it way before me. So uh, they bring it up themselves a lot of times, but if it's not bothering them and it's only bothering me, really, it doesn't matter because it's what patients want and it's with cosmetic dentistry because it's not a need, they have to want to do it. And usually I let them address it. Uh, sometimes if they don't talk about it and it's really annoying and I kind of want to cut my OCD kicks in and I want to talk about it, I bring it up in a very subtle way. Like, have you ever thought about closing the gaps or have you ever thought about brightening up the shades or addressing the shape? And if the answer is no, you leave it at that. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. So I think we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, someone asked, did your patient or did your patient have issues with dislodged blood clots when you removed teeth due to his smoking? Actually, that's such a good question. They did not because I kid you not, I called them three times every day after the extraction for five days. So that's how I did it. <laughs> Got it. I guess we have time real quick for this last question. Someone said for case two, um, yeah. they didn't catch um, if you ended up doing crowns or veneers on the six front teeth, they're wondering. Uh, okay. Case two, like I said before, they had existing crowns. So what you saw in that slide, the before picture, that was the existing crowns. When they already have crowns, you don't have the option of doing veneers because crowns are full coverage resin, uh, full coverage restorations, right? They cover the front and the back of the teeth. Whereas the veneers, they only cover the front of the teeth. So if the back side of the teeth is already shaved and drilled, you can't just leave it floating. It has to be covered. If it's a crown, it has to be a crown. Dr. Rafi, it's been an honor having you. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I want to thank everyone else for joining as well. If you guys have any questions for those who are watching after the live stream, please check out Dr. Rafi's Instagram. It can be found on the PowerPoint in front of our screen. And um, for those looking for the quiz, that can be found on our link tree or group me. But uh, I want to thank everyone for joining once again, and I hope you all have a, a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. And I want to thank my friends, too, for supporting.